isn't this everybody's dream to live on the coast, the sea right here, the beautiful breeze to cool us off? Sure, great for us humans, but not so good for plants. And the most question that I'm asked all the time is how on earth do I garden on the coast? How do I deal with the soil? Because the water just runs through it and all the plants die. And that's because of all the salt air that comes off the ocean. So today we're gonna to show you the hacks of how to get it right so that you too can garden right on the coast. So folks, the biggest issue with coastal gardening is the soil. Because unfortunately, most of you are gardening on reclaimed sea sand, dunes. I mean, remember that Durban used to be right up to the Berea, used to be just sea. Likewise in Cape Town, where people are building houses now and trying to garden, that hundreds and millions of years ago used to be ocean. So folks, this is the issue. You can see that even if I try and form literally a clod with it, it doesn't hold, it just breaks up. And that shows that the soil is lacking in humic content. Humic content is basically organic matter. So that's leaves, it's the carbon, it's everything that plants need in order to grow. So that is a no-no. The biggest issue with it is soil like this is besides the carbon that's missing, the other issue is that water simply just pours off it. And to illustrate that, have a look here. When we put some water down, See, it just, it just like runs off. And that is the biggest issue because as you're watering, it literally just runs, it doesn't get sucked up a lot. And then you find that your plants dry out more and more. So let me show you how we're gonna do it because we got some tricks up our sleeves to fix all of that. Right, first off, I got a glass of water. Oh, pretty cool. Water the things that plants need. So I wanna show you this amazing, amazing product. Um, it's called WaterWise Crystals. Take a look at it, folks. Really just very, very fine granules. But all of these crystals you add to your soil. You either add to your soil in a container or you would add it to your garden soil. And I've got about two grams here. And I wanna show you the amazing ability of this to illustrate how good it's gonna be in your garden. So all I'm gonna do is pop some into this glass of water, okay? And then we give it a stir. Kids are gonna love this stuff, which is probably why I love playing with it. Um, my best party trick so far. <laughs> and leave it for one or two seconds and already you can see the consistency changing. And I'm gonna drop this down, leave it for about a minute and pick it up again and show you what's happened. So about a minute has gone by. <laughs> Look where my spoon is. <laughs> you see that? And do you see that? Watch it come out, watch here. This is the most amazing stuff. It sucked up all the water. It's formed this beautiful gelatinous goo. And think about that. Two or three grams of the water-wise crystals in this glass of water sucked up all that water. So imagine in your garden, all you're going to be doing is sprinkling the water-wise crystals over your area that you're preparing. It takes up the moisture that it needs when you're watering. And while you're away at work, or while the wind is blowing, drying out your plants, the plants simply reabsorb it from the gelatine that's here. Unbelievable, and how cool is it to play with? The other thing, guys, it's completely safe. You could eat this, the dogs could eat it. Of course, you could spend all day playing with it, um, but I believe I'm meant to be showing you some gardening. Right, folks, so in order to prep your soil, I'm just gonna take out these few little aggies that are here. And this is gonna be your standard formula for whenever you are prepping soil. I mean, you can actually just see, look how easy this fork goes in. And, and that is because of what we're dealing with. So whatever your area is, this is how we're gonna go about it. Right, first up, let's take a look. We're gonna add in some of our water-wise crystals, about two grams and we're simply just gonna sprinkle that over the area where we're prepping. Okay, not a lot, guys, remember? It's in a small container. We saw how much it swelled, so you really don't need all that much. 
Of course, we're going to be putting in the bone meal. I would go with four handfuls per square meter at least. And then our organic pellets. Then we're going to add in some of our coconut husk. And here, if you can, put on quite a nice liberal layer. And then last but not least, adding a nice full layer of compost over the soil. Then all we do is turn it in with the garden fork. So remember what we started off with? We started off with soil looking like that, all right? After we've added all our bits into it, we've already got organic content. You can see the difference quite clearly. And if I have to do that now, as opposed to this, which still just breaks apart, do you see the difference? And that is what we want. So there it is, that's the formula, guys. And if you follow that and you get the ground prep correct, well then the rest is simply a breeze. Excuse the pun. But let's show you some really good plants that are gonna cope with the sea breeze that are kind of foolproof, bomb-proof, coast-proof. So there are a couple of traits that you need to look for when choosing plants if you're gonna be gardening on the coast. And if you stick with these things, then you're going to be okay. So the first thing is strappy leaves. Do you see this? It's almost quite fleshy. You can bend them, turn them without them breaking. This is an agapanthus. It's called agapanthus zambezi. What I love about this plant is that when it doesn't have its flower, which it sends up here, that you've still got the variegation in the leaf. Because of the thick fleshy leaves, they don't lose a lot of water with the sea breeze. And plus, they actually cope with a lot of the salt. They don't mind it at all. Now, as a combination to go with it, this gray, and this is a gazania. The most important part about this is here. The underside is gray. The top side is gray, and it's actually, if you look really closely, it's even got some hairs on it. So the hairs are there to reflect the sun. Perfect, perfect, and ideal for any coastal gardening. So, two things, anything with a gray leaf and anything with a thick, strappy leaf. If you go with those, you are set to go. Two great indigenous plants that work so well on the coast are these two babies. This little guy over here is called Uriops. Uriops is our indigenous daisy and not a bad looking fella, I might say. It flowers throughout the summer and right into autumn and is a tough guy. There's your telltale sign. Gray leaves and if you look carefully on the back, you can even see there's some hairs. Another beauty. This is a pelagonium, a geranium. They've also, if you feel Feel on the leaves, it's furry. Loves the full sun, can grow in pretty poor soils and doesn't require too much water. And the beauty about this plant is that even when it doesn't have flowers, I mean, who could resist that foliage? It's wicked. Of course, we could not be doing coastal gardening without mentioning our beautiful Fahis Fet Planter succulents because they just fit the profile. Take a look here, we've got this little Mesembryanthemum. Um, that's your typical Fahi that loves growing naturally on the west coast and all the way up the garden route. It's got those thick fleshy leaves and all of these plants show those same characteristics. Of course, here, the little Echeveria, thick fleshy leaves, also a bit of grey on them. These are little sedums. Any sedum family, whether it's even up to the large leaf varieties, will do very, very well. And here is another indigenous little Plectranthus. This will grow where the wind howls, folks. Any of these I would welcome in a coastal garden because I know that they are tough. So keep in mind, it's gray. It's a little bit of hairs on the leaves. If you can wipe it off even better and thick, fleshy, fleshy stems.